Well, uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Scott Ramsey, <laughs> and uh, welcome to the uh, second half of our session. And for those of you who were um, here uh, yesterday, thanks for coming again. And for those who are new, uh, welcome, and we're very, very glad to have you. Uh, in keeping with our theme of trying to really look at what's going on in the field, uh, this next session is really going to focus on reports from the field, if you will, on uh, practice changing strategies to deliver uh, lower cost, high quality uh, cancer care. Uh, we've got a long session, but we're going to have a break um, after our first group of speakers. And I, and I should say as an aside that Peter Bach is, uh, is flying down uh, and is expected here about 8.30. Uh, if he is not here when he's up, what we'll do is we'll have a um, question and answer after the first two speakers, a short break, and then allow Peter uh, into the next session. Um, but with that, uh, I'd rather keep my remarks to a, to a minimum uh, and turn it over to uh, Jesse Grumman, who's uh, from the Center for Advancing Health, and she's going to be talking on patient-centeredness in delivering affordable care. Jesse. So I'm going to date myself and say, like, good morning, Vietnam. <laughs> You're dating yourselves, too. <laughs> so I, um, I'm speaking today wearing two hats. First, I'm the president of the Center for Advancing Health. Uh, it's a nonprofit I uh, started in uh, Washington, D.C. in 1992 uh, to focus on patient engagement. That is, what do we have to do to find good health care and make the most of it? Uh, we speak and write and conduct research from the perspective of patients. Uh, my, the second hat that I wear is as a person who's uh, received four cancer-related diagnoses in my life, and I live every day with the sequelae of that many diagnoses and that much treatment. I am a frequent, although not enthusiastic, user of healthcare services. So uh, late on the Friday before Labor Day two years ago, I got a call from my gastroenterologist, and he said, <clears throat> Remember, remember that um, ulcer I found on your um, endoscopy last week? It's stomach cancer. And for the fourth time, I felt as though I had been drop kicked into a foreign country. I didn't know the language. I didn't understand the culture. I didn't have a map. And I desperately, desperately wanted to find my way home. Um, I was vividly, vividly aware that being engaged in my health care was not something that I could do if I had a little extra time and access to broadband, you know. It was going to be necessary. Only by interviewing three surgeons did I understand that their different approaches would make a profound difference in the quality of my life for the rest of my life. Only by listening really carefully uh, did I discover that their varied surgical approaches wouldn't make any difference to the risk of recurrence. Only through considerable research and a series of very tough conversations with my oncologist did, could we figure out how to kind of manage the right um, chemotherapy regimen for me. Only by understanding my insurance benefit and spending time with my health plan could I ensure that the tests I needed and the treatment that I needed would be covered at least in the near term. Only with um, competent and really consistent help from my husband was I able to remember and understand and share in the decisions that I needed to make about my treatment. And only with this huge investment of energy was I able to make and keep all the appointments, get the tests, take the drugs, make sure all of my doctors had all of my records uh, and notes so that they could advise me accurately and help me make it safely here today. You know, this was really a heavy lift for me. Even with the experience of three previous cancer diagnoses, a treatment in advocating for patient engagement, and really, really, really good connections. It's sobering for me to consider, and it should be for you, to consider what it takes for people who know less and have less to face these challenges. 
millions of dollars of research were concentrated into procedures and consultations and drugs that were costing thousands of dollars to administer. And if I didn't show up, if I didn't do my part, that money would have been wasted. And of course, I would be the one that would suffer the most, but it's not as though those resources couldn't have been used elsewhere. I'm not alone in finding what it takes to get good health care um, to be really difficult. I've interviewed hundreds of people and about their experiences with health care, and they, patients and caregivers alike, tell really similar stories of being surprised and burdened by what they have to do to find good care and make use of it in order to, so that it kind of gives them the best possible outcome within the limits and of their values and their preferences. So I've been asked to open this first session of the morning by discussing patient-centeredness in making care more affordable. I'm going to begin by talking a little bit about prices for patients uh, and then talk about how true patient-centeredness <clears throat> suggests some organizational um, and payment policies that might serve our aims of the best possible outcome for us as individuals um, at the same time addressing the system's aim of more affordable care. So affordability, a lot of people yesterday said, well, affordability for whom, um, or asked. Uh, and I think it's worth making a distinction between price and cost. The cost of health care, of course, refers to the dollars required by the system to produce the, and deliver care and prices, what we pay. Um, for the services and drugs and devices that we need to live with or um, recover from cancer. Few of us, whether we have cancer or not, are actually concerned about the cost of care, especially when we're sick. It just floats by us. Um, but in these kind of hard economic times, the price of our care has become more salient to many of us. I don't um, only mean what we pay in deductibles and co-pays and the bills that are not reimbursed, but price also includes, for us, the broader financial implications of lost wages, child care, transportation during treatment, um, and then the ability to, turn to, to return to work, to drive, to care for kids, and to absorb the impact of treatment, you know, kind of permanent chemo brain, uh, pain, neuropathy, trouble eating, swallowing, mobility, all of those kind of things, to us, figure into price and the discussion of price. I think, in general, uh, a cancer diagnosis sets off, you know, um, a fairly predictable first reaction, which is, oh, I will pay anything. I'll sell the house. I'll um, take my re cash in my retirement account to save the life of my kid or my spouse or myself. Um, quickly, though, the discussion kind of bifurcates a little, hinging on the insurance question. If you have no insurance, um, you go down the road of um, uh, looking at savings and mortgages and church fundraisers and spending down. Um, and if you do have insurance, you kind of hand over the card and hope for the best, or at least most of us do. Um, it's worth noting, <clears throat> as somebody I can't remember who did yesterday, um, perhaps Scott, that um, many physicians are reluctant to talk with us about the price of care, um, despite the fact that ASCO encourages you to do so. Um, I think there's little information, little relevant information. Many people feel unprepared. And I think I've heard that many of you feel that you don't want to put a price on your beneficence. Uh, it's also worth noting <clears throat> that even for those of us who would be inclined to base our treatment on um, the price of chemotherapy drugs or physician fees, um, are hard pressed to do so. Price information relevant to individuals is rarely available. And there's simply no information to support cost quality um, comparisons for uh, cancer care delivered by physicians or by hospitals. Um, Medicare.gov, Yelp, Consumer Reports, US News, 
the, um, they offer laughably inadequate information to support any rational decisions about cancer care. This situation is not sustainable for us. We patients and families may not want to believe that our lives and our hope and our physicians' goodwill have a price, but increasingly, we have to come to terms with that uncomfortable fact. Um, we need the tools and we need the leadership from our clinicians um, to consider price, both financial price and broad price, as part of our shared decision making about treatment. That said, I don't, um, I don't really actually believe that generally we as patients, or particularly we as cancer patients, are ever going to act like consumers and make rational price quality risk trade-offs in the purchase of care to save our lives. Uh, and even if we do, those of us who do won't do so in sufficient numbers to save any money for anybody. But I do think that the current intense focus on triple aims, the Choosing Wisely initiative, uh, in combination with secular trends and the current economic climate, are sufficiently aligned with our concerns to, about the, to, to have an influence about what we do for the price, about the cost of care. But that alignment depends on the recognition of the critical role that we patients now play in the success of cancer treatment. As someone who's lived my entire life, deeply inter adult life at least, deeply intertwined with the healthcare system, I can tell you with great confidence what patient-centered care is. Patient-centered care is care that enables me to find good care and make use of it to achieve the best possible outcome consistent with my preferences. Let me just say that again, because this is, this is really important for patients. It's care that enables me to do what I need to do to, make the, to find good care and to make the best use of it. In the case of cancer care, this means that care is organized to facilitate what I have to do to confirm my disease, to find good doctors, to get the tests I need, to gather the information and opinions, to find the way forward, to work with my doctor to develop a treatment plan, to make sure that all of my doctors have all my records, which is an incredible administrative task for cancer, especially in the absence, as we heard yesterday, of an interoperable, transportable health, electronic health record. And then I have to implement the treatment plan by getting surgery and recovering from that and doing the radiation and the chemotherapy and managing the nausea, the pain, the neuropathy, um, pay the insurance deductibles, do all of the denials, uh, and then work with my oncologist in an ongoing way to modify the treatment plan as appropriate. This is a big deal. <laughs> um, I talked earlier about how my recent experience with stomach cancer brought home for, to me exactly how much I had to know and do in order to get care that would give me the best possible outcome. And so I'd like to expand just a little bit on that. Um, choosing who was going to care for me wasn't easy. I, I needed to find somebody who could kind of handle my Baroque medical history, uh, someone who had expertise in, of course, my disease, and someone who I could work with. You can't imagine. Well, you can, because you would do the same thing you know, trying to find the right person to treat you. Who do you call? And where in the country do you call to kind of triangulate that information back? Um, there's, believe me, there's no, no, no useful information to help you make this decision. But, you know, if we were to have valid and reliable information, we'd be better able to choose the best doctor and the best hospital for us and also perhaps contribute to a greater demand for higher quality care. Another example. So the excruciating process I went through to decide whether I needed chemotherapy and if so, what, uh, involved consults with multiple, uh, Deb Schrag's not here. With multiple, multiple oncologists all over the country. Um, it, perhaps it was excessive, but it was a pretty big decision given my history. Um, there's broad agreement um, among clinicians and patients 
that from getting from diagnosis through treatment is something that um, it requires a lot of interaction, a lot of trust building, um, a lot of shared decision making, a lot of just just understanding what this is going to be, what's going to happen, what are the possible late effects and the side effects. And as Deb probably talked about yesterday, um, to talk about the benefits and the relative magnitude of the benefits of cancer treatment. These are tough conversations. You can't just have those things on, a, on the fly. Um, and there's broad agreement among patients and doctors that we rarely have enough time to actually have these conversations so that both we and our clinician feel satisfied. But you know, when we understand our options and we make decisions with our doctors and we have a sense of what to expect and we know that our doctor will be there to help us make these tough decisions along the way, we're more confident about our care. And I think that such discussions lead us or help us to make decisions that are about our care that not only um, will benefit us more, but kind of simultaneously are of higher quality. And a final example, uh, being treated for cancer means that we and our loved ones <clears throat> manage our medications and our symptoms and devices and rehab. We do a lot of stuff that used to be done by professionals in hospitals. Um, at the American Asso Hospital Association came out with a report last week that said that half of family caregivers now do medical and nursing tasks at home. Um, it, it, caring for someone who's in cancer treatment, as you know, is a lot. It's a big deal. For, it's very disruptive to families. Um, but in addition to that, um, my, that was hard for me this most recent time, but in addition to that, the hassle factor was just, you cannot imagine. You know, so um, the chemo suite and my doctor are not communicating. Who has to run interference? Um, uh, mis uh, the lost lab results. Um, a new drug, drug causes itching. Nobody calls back. Bad symptoms on a weekend. There's no arrangements for kind of after or after hours care. It, it, it just you know at every step of the way, my treatment could kind of come to a halt for a week, or I would be tossed back into medical care unnecessarily just because I didn't have access to somebody who could say you know here here try this or why don't you try this and then this and then and then we'll nothing. So when we, <laughs> when we have the support, when we have good support to care for ourselves at home, uh, we're more satisfied, we do better, and we also rack up fewer costs to the system. These are three types of tasks that we have to do that have the potential to improve the outcome of our treatment um, and care that enables us to do these tasks. Uh, is what patient-centered care is. We can make informed choices about which doctors and hospitals are right for us. That's really good for us. It's best for us to do that. We can consider evidence of risks and trade-offs and benefits that we share uh, uh, that, and talk about, share decisions with our physicians about treatment, about palliative care, about end-of-life care. And we can be supported to successfully care for ourselves and our loved ones at home during and after treatment. Now, I want to suggest four policies that would um, help us to meet these demands more successfully. We need good cancer treatment quality measures, evidence-based ones, including uh, we need a cancer caps uh, set. And this information needs to be gathered and disseminated in places that we can find it in order to help us make good decisions about our doctors and hospitals. We need higher, re or we, our doctors need higher reimbursement for cognitive services. Um, this will give them an incentive, you an incentive, to spend more time talking to us and hopefully provide a disincentive to recommend uh, useless or um, extra services and tests. And uh, we need bundled payments uh, or episodes of care payments that have the potential to give our doctors the flexibility to plan and make, spend time with us and make decisions with us about the shared project of our health throughout treatment and recovery. And we need an oncology patient-centered medical home. 
Uh, John Sprandios um, has done wonderful work both kind of putting one of those up and, and evaluating it in terms of both the cost that it saves, but more important to us, um, the kind of outcomes that it achieves in terms of really supporting patients in that medical home throughout uh, their um, cancer trajectory. Um, for the remainder of this session this morning, we're going to hear from my fellow panel members about uh, the feasibility of each of these and other policies that reduce the cost of care to the system. From the perspective of a patient, um, all these policies support care that's patient-centered. Each one would increase the likelihood of our doctors, um, that our doctors can help us <clears throat> understand the impact of, of cancer and its treatment, the financial price, and the other prices that we'll pay. And each one makes it possible for our doctors to provide the support we need to make the best possible use of the care we assemble to take us step by step through our treatment to help us reach our precious goal to live for as well as we can for as long as we can. Thank you. Thanks, Jesse. Now we're going to hear from uh, Lee Newcomer. Uh, Lee Newcomer is uh, Medical Director for Oncology at United Healthcare, and he's going to pre present some insurer, health insurer perspectives, commercial health insurer perspectives, I presume, on delivering affordable cancer care. So one of the problems with coming late in the program is that all the good things have been said, and uh, that's already happened here. We've had a day full of great information, and I'll be repeating a lot of points, but they're probably worth repeating. So we'll go ahead and get started. Let's start with the uh, same slide that everybody else did, and that's why we have to do something. And um, I want to point out, though, that this slide is really alarming for me. Two data points here. This is the year 2016 when 50 percent of the average U.S. salary will go to out-of-pocket expenses and health insurance premiums. We are four years away from that. That's given current trends in wages, current trends in insurance premiums and medical costs. So in less than four years, 50% of the average U.S. salary there, and just a little time period later, about 12 to 14 years later, your entire U.S. salary will have to go pay for medical premiums and out-of-pocket expenses. And if that doesn't give anybody a sense of urgency here, uh, you need a little more coffee. Um, I'm very concerned about this, and I think it was Zeke actually who yesterday said somewhere between here and here, the foreign countries that hold our bonds are going to say, we don't trust you to manage this anymore, and we will have a pretty severe financial crisis. So things will change. There is no doubt in my mind about that, but if we don't do something now in the very immediate future, the change that will occur in this time period, and it could be here or here, will be rather drastic. So I, I, if anything else comes out of this talk today, I want you to feel that same sense of urgency that we do not have time to do long controlled studies any longer. So before we talk about what could be done, we need to know where the money goes today. And, and uh, these questions arose yesterday as well. But for our commercially insured population, and we spend about $2 billion on cancer care, um, this is where the money goes. Uh, chemotherapy agents account for about a quarter of the cost, hospitals a little more than half, physicians, and this is all physicians, not just medical oncologists alone, the surgeons, radiation oncologists, everybody's in there, account for the other quarter of the funds. There are problems there. Everybody tends to know that pharmaceutical costs are rising dramatically. They are. They're in the double-digit range. And it's not just new drugs, it's also old drugs that are inflating very rapidly. Uh, you'll notice that they tend to cost increase usually about 7% every year, even though they've been on the market for a number of years. And Deb Schrag actually addressed the problem here yesterday. I have it labeled as seller's market. That's actually not correct. There is no market. It is simply the sellers naming their price. Um, when a new compound comes out in oncology, it's generally unique and it's novel. So I don't have a way to say to uh, the new company, here we have a competitor, let's have a bidding process to see who has a lower price product. 
Uh, I don't have a substitution effect that I can enforce. And as Deb pointed out yesterday, uh, in almost every state in the nation, I am required to cover this. Uh, it's part of the law. I can't have an insurance plan without that. So if you're in a market where you can bring a product to the market, you have guaranteed payment by a third party, you can price anything you want. And that is exactly what is happening. Um, the latest example, this deck is about um, three weeks old. So this is, of course, now outdated. Uh, Zaltrap has replaced it. But it, it, I think it represents all the good and bad about good, uh, good drugs. This is pertuzumab, an excellent drug. It extends progression pre survival in, in HER2 overexpressed breast cancer patients by six months. That's a significant effect. And it also costs $188,000 to get to that 18 months of therapy. That's at Medicare rates, not what I have to pay. It's a huge amount of money. And imagine having to mortgage your house for your first single payment for $188,000. And the point here is, is that we have good medicines, but we're going to have to figure out how to get them delivered to the marketplace at, less, at, a, at a lower cost. I do not have any way of lowering that cost. I simply have to pay it and pass it on as premiums, and that gets us right back to the first slide about how much income is going to medical care. We often hear that these drugs are expensive to produce. They are, but I would argue they can be produced less expensively. And I just want to make sure that everyone is aware these are the profit margins of the, pharma, of the biological uh, therapeutic companies. And they range anywhere from uh, the 20s to the 40 percent range. There's only one industry that does better than that in the entire spectrum of Wall Street, and that's oil. So there's plenty of room there to begin lowering prices and think about uh, other strategies. Um, I, I don't believe that it can't be done. The second area is hospitals. And believe it or not, they are inflating every bit as rapidly as uh, drugs. In fact, uh, they're keeping a very nice pace with double-digit inflation. And they have a couple of advantages here that I think I would consider to be less than market ideals. One is that they can access those chemotherapy medications for 40 to 50 percent discounts through a legislative uh, quirk known as 340B. So they have a natural advantage over physicians practicing in the community. And they can acquire the drugs for a significantly lower amount. And secondly, they can charge a lot more for them because of this process called um, bed access bundling. It's very rare now to walk into a community where there's only where there's more than two hospital systems. Um, you can name a few, but not many. And the point being there is that you can't operate a health plan without having both systems in your health plan as an offering. If you take one out, you're going to take a substantial reduction in membership and the economics don't work well. Hospitals know that. So when we walk to the negotiating table with a hospital, we have about as much leverage as we did with the pharmaceutical company. They'll say to us, this year it's going to be a 9% raise, and they know full well that I can't walk away from the table. So they're getting double-digit raises. Um, and if we say to them, you're, spending, you're charging way too much for pharmaceutical medications, which is happening, there's a markups average about 250%. What they say to us is, fine, we'll just put it somewhere else. You'll pay a little bit more for a bed day than you did for that drug. So the increases are there, and where you distribute them is just a matter of accounting. But today, a lot of oncology medications have very substantial markups, mainly because that was a way to get bed prices down instead. And we may, even if we redistribute that, the total cost of hospital care is not going to go away. And finally, we have physicians who have actually have the weakest negotiating position and unfortunately then have taken the biggest economic hit. Um, trends or increases for physicians have actually been negative in the last couple of years. Uh, they've gotten slight increases in reimbursement, but utilization has gone down. And the overall trend or in revenue for physicians has decreased uh, in the last few years. They, however, control the other 75 percent of spending. And unfortunately, right now, it's been very inconsistent. So let me just give you a little peek into that. We've been working, as everyone knows, with five medical groups on an episode payment basis. And one of the uh, very uh, wonderful deliverables from that has been that we now have about 68 measures that we can do on an oncology practice um, that the episodes group has worked with us to develop. 
And those measures look at everything from total cost of care to quality. So we can look at survivals, relapse rates, progression-free survival, hospitalizations, emergency uh, visits, total cost of care, cost for drugs, et cetera. So here's five people that came to us voluntarily said, we want to do something different. What we did was agree on each group having a common pathway for about 19 different clinical conditions. Each one of those conditions, they named the pathway they believed to be best. Uh, we didn't choose it, they did. And then the, print, the idea was they would adhere to that pathway. We paid them on an episode basis for it, and we would measure performance. Episode fees would go up for better performance. This is uh, one of the conditions we looked at. It's uh, early stage breast cancer, ER positive, HER2 um, underexpressed. The groups all decided that they would use TC chemotherapy. There are, what, 28, 29 patients in this slide. And you can see that groups using the same regimen for the same group of patients had costs varying from $30,000 to $55,000 for therapy. And the blue represents drug costs, red hospitalizations. Uh, green, all other. Okay. The same patient, same treatment, and yet we see a twofold difference in cost. And it turns out, again, very well intentioned groups, and only about half the patients in this actually got TC, that for various reasons, errors, uh, physician forgetting, there were other drugs added, and hence some of the variation. But there's also huge variation in the use of radiology services, in radiotherapy services, in laboratory services, and so on. We just don't practice consistently, uh, even among groups who are very well-intentioned. Uh, I would consider them to be um, the top quartile. Another example from these same groups, this looks at the use of radiology procedures for a four-month period with metastatic disease. Okay? So these are patients with metastatic lung, breast, and colon, and all we did was measure how many x-rays did you take every four-month period and what did it cost. And again, you can see the kind of variation that occurs here. Uh, uh, this is 12 patients, 134 x-rays, and that's the cost, about $6,000 per patient versus somebody else who did uh, about, what, 10 per, I'm sorry, wrong graph there, uh, about 10 there, $3,000. Huge variation. I'll use one more example. This is Avastin. Um, in 2009, we just looked at our Avastin usage against the NCCN guidelines and discovered that 55% of it didn't match NCCN. Uh, so we simply said at, at the bar here, um, the NCCN is our standard. If you're doing that, it'll get covered. If not, it will not. And remember, NCCN recommends Avastin for breast cancer. So um, this is, does not have a breast cancer effect in it. And yet we've seen utilization go down by well over one half or 50 percent just by saying let's do where the evidence, let's do what the evidence supports and get rid of the rest. And there's been a substantial decrease in the usage of that drug. Okay. The variation that we deal with is huge. And if you'll notice in all those examples, we could cut variation by half. And that implies to me that perhaps we could cut expenses by half as well. So what is it that we need? I, I think number one is that we need standard approaches. Um, for those of you that haven't read Atul Gawande's Cheesecake Factory article, I would highly recommend it. Uh, he does a very nice job of looking at another industry that produces complex uh, products that have to be done in real time. I think he said they have over 350 menu items. And yet, by standardizing, they can do it and do it well. And he has, a, uh, I think, a very thoughtful discussion about how much of that could be translated to medicine. John Sprandio, who's in the audience, has done that at his practice. And uh, if you haven't heard the results, I, I'll let John talk directly in the discussion, but he's cut his hospitalization and ER uh, usage by uh, just a little less than half by looking at standard ways to approach patient problems and making sure that they have access, as we just heard about in the previous talk. The second is the use of cost-effective therapies, and you saw a nice demonstration of this yesterday with the gastric uh, chemotherapy regimens, how there's wide variation in costs of regimens that do exactly the same thing. And if we can shift to the less expensive medications, um, I, we are not harming patients, and we clearly could make a difference in the cost of, of treatment. And the third thing that we need desperately is an agreement on what is value. Is a one-month prolongation of disease-free survival value? Is that something we should be treating with? 
Um, or do we need some kind of standard that says we need a pertuzumab with six before we really think about uh, what our next step is? There's no common agreement on that. So I'll get abstracts pretty commonly every July. I get uh, dozens of requests to treat somebody with a new regimen because the abstract showed a one-week prolongation of survival or a, a better response rate of two-tenths of a percent. So what are we thinking about doing? Um, one is creating a performance measurement system, and a, there's a check behind it because I think that's what episodes did very, very well. I feel quite comfortable that with a minimal amount of clinical information and a claims data set, we can produce very valuable information about how oncologists are performing. The episode payment program is described in a lot of detail in a health affairs article, so I won't go into it in great detail, but what we've done there is taken the profit margin from the drug regimen. We calculated off what the, each of these five groups used to make in drug profit on our, based on our current contract. We moved that and called it a patient care fee. And we pay it on the first day they see the patient. It's theirs for that, no matter uh, how long they treat the patient. We pay all the drugs it costs now. And the only way you get your patient care or episode fee raised is you do one of two things. You either get a better outcome on those measures or you reduce the total cost of care. And if you reduce the total cost of care, we share that between the employer, the physicians, and us. Uh, and the real challenge in that program right now is we've got the data. We know where we have to reduce variation, but that's where the rubber meets the road. And I think everybody's struggling with how do we get that variation reduced. Um, it takes a lot of time and effort and work. I think you're going to see, if you haven't seen in the, in the marketplace already, differential fee schedules that are based on performance. So setting targets. Uh, for example, uh, John Sprandio's group could come to us and say, I can reduce your hospitalization rate by half. We discover we have a whole eight patients in his practice, so um, we're not going to make any uh, big inroads with him. But the concept is we set a target for hospitalization rates based on what we know is possible. And if groups hit those, then in the following year, their fee schedule gets a dramatic escalation. But you have to hit the targets. We polled our customers, the self-funded employers, and said, could we set up bonus pools? Will you put some money aside so that we could pay those? 90% of them said, absolutely not, until we see the performance is really changing. They're not willing to take it on faith that you're doing good stuff anymore. They want to see the results. Um, and then finally, I think what you're going to see is some limitation of networks um, based on expertise. That um, in many communities, you may see that we'll only have one group doing prostatic evaluations and surgery, or one group doing breast cancer evaluations. And that will happen on the basis of an RFP. We're working with two big multi-specialty groups right now to create what we cons consider to be a non-biased, consumer-based approach to cancer. So in the first pilot, we're putting together a breast cancer team, surgeons, radiation oncologists, medical oncologists. The newly diagnosed breast cancer patient comes in and talks to all of them, understands all of her options, and then makes a decision based on, uh, on hearing that information with her coach and her preferences. And the fee to the center is the same. So it doesn't matter what the patient takes in terms of approach. It's a single fee. And so we don't have the, the economic advantage for uh, the biases to do one thing or the other. Whether that patient wants a lumpectomy or a mastectomy, the center will be paid the same. Whether that patient elects for adjuvant therapy or not, the payment would be the same. Uh, it's an experiment, but we hope that it might lead us in the direction of getting a little bit more consumer advocacy in the decision process. So I'll end with this. Um, revenues are going to go down. Uh, there is just no doubt about that. And, and go back to that first slide if you ever have any uh, question that revenues won't have to decrease. They do. The second is the only way that you can survive in that environment is to reduce your cost structure. And for physicians, that's helping reduce variation. For hospitals and pharma, I'm afraid that, that the measures may have to be more draconian. Uh, they may be legislative. They may be just certain things aren't covered. And then finally, if we're going to be successful, if those costs come down, we need to share those with the decision makers who helped us do it. And that's what the episode types of payments are about. 
Uh, and the other approaches we're taking is, as they bring costs down while maintaining quality, how can we, in fact, share some of those savings with the decision makers who are doing the extra work to make it happen? And if we don't do that, then I'm afraid that we'll see a large number of physicians either go under or be unsuccessful, because it is going to take extra work and extra effort. And with that, I'm looking for Peter. He's not here. So what do we want to do, Scott? <clears throat> I think, um, you want me to give his talk? Well, sure. <laughs> I actually had offered to give his talk, <laughs> but I don't. I, I, he, he did send an email. He said he hoped to be here by 8.30. But I think what we'll do is if, if we could invite Jesse up uh, and then have a, a brief. Oh, well, we could do that. Um, So we'll have um, so uh, we'll have our, our presenters from community oncology practices uh, give their talks. So there'll be two: Peter Eisenberg and Robert Green. Uh, and then after that, uh, we'll have uh, the four and uh, go ahead and, and do question and answer. And if Peter is here, then we'll have him substitute in. Thank you. About Forty minutes, right? Forty minutes. Minus twenty. <laughs> I'm not expecting a phone call. Um, Okay, here we are. Um, I'm in private practice in Marin County, California. We are six medical oncologists, three radiation oncologists, and four, four urologists. Don't ask me how that happened. Uh, there we go. Um, I'm fond of ASCO. Uh, I work for Lee Newcomer as chairman of his uh, oncology uh, committee. We do lots of pharmaceutical and NCI drug studies. Um, our practice has an interest in imaging and radiation um, as partners with our local hospital. Um, I'm going to give you a little bit of history of me, uh, talk about what I perceive our patients uh, uh, and their families' needs are, um, talk about some barriers and perhaps some fixes. Um, I started practice in 1978, uh, despite my youthful appearance. And um, in the mid-'80s, started reviewing some Blue Shield claims for um, a patient who worked for Blue Shield. Uh, I was impressed with the variability of care um, and actually didn't, couldn't figure out how some of the care given um, uh, got, got to be given. Um, in the mid-late-'80s, it occurred to me that selling chemotherapy was not uh, a sustainable business plan, and what's remarkable it is that it's taken 20 years or so for us to be actually talking about this now. Um, in 1989, uh, when um, ASCO was in San Francisco, um, because it uh, seemed to me that uh, having some um, guidelines would help me in my job at Blue Shield, uh, I went to a clinical practice committee meeting and asked, what are the plans for coming up with some guidelines, and uh, was uh, railroaded out of the room. Um, what's interesting is we never hear the term cookbook medicine anymore. And just like that was what we heard all the time in the old days, um, uh, things have changed over time. Uh, in addition, when I talk to patients about quality of life, when I bring up the words quality of life, they know what that means. And a few years ago, um, hardly anybody knew really what that meant, especially patients. Um, in 1990, um, uh, perceiving that maybe I could get, we could get some docs together in Northern California to agree upon some rules and uh, have insurance companies recognize that we would be doing good and they would reward us by paying us well for it, um, I got some of my pals together and we started the Association of Northern California Oncologists. Um, I was wrong on both counts. I couldn't get the docs together and the insurance companies weren't interested. Um, and at a membership meeting where I presented some guidelines that our local science committee came up with for the use of Neupogen, a new drug that cost a couple hundred bucks a shot that didn't cure cancer, um, one of the docs said to me these words, Peter, we ain't paying dues to an organization who tells us how to practice medicine. Keep in mind, this is 1990. Um, for a number of years in the mid-90s, 
uh, we tried to put together uh, a Northern California group of oncologists, and um, the best we could do was merge with a small practice in San Mateo, our small practice. Um, but what I learned from that was uh, we need to know what we're doing. And so we started uh, tracking how we practice medicine and presented this to payers, and payers saw that from our results, double the use of hospice, um, half the use of the hospital for folks to die, uh, less use of growth factors that we were worth uh, uh, paying more to. I think what patients and their families need and want is our honest scientific and clinical assessment of their situation, our appreciation, uh, our application of the science to their condition, the truth of what's uh, going on with them, uh, an understanding of who they are, uh, kindness and compassion, and our best shot. And um, this morning, Lee and I, over breakfast, were talking about uh, how long is it appropriate to wait to see the doctor when you're newly diagnosed with cancer? 10 days? Not likely. We try to get people in that day or the next day. It, I cannot imagine going through a weekend without being seen by an oncologist. And even if I don't have any records at all, they see that I'm interested. And they understand that they have a colleague. And um, I can see by your nodding, <laughs> there, there's some truth to this. Um, what can we offer them? We can offer them the truth. We can offer an explanation of their illness and its consequences, uh, the results of the best designed trials, problem solving assistance. And interestingly enough, if, if when I give patients choices, they don't know the answer, my sense is that I haven't explained it well enough and we'll do it again. Um, uh, our support of their decisions and understanding kindness, compassion, and our best shot. The first thing to do, the first thing I do is they ask a patient what she wants. It's rude to tell people stuff they don't want to hear. <laughs> and people tell you one way or another what they want to hear. Um, explain the natural history of the diseases, and we know the natural, natural history of these diseases, with and without therapy and what kinds of therapies, what the options, including the benefits and side effects are. That's kind of where I'm starting from. Um, so what kind of barriers are there? Um, it costs a lot of money to practice medicine. Uh, we have 11,000 square feet. We pay almost four bucks a square foot per month. That's 40 grand a month. We have 21 employees for the six medical oncologists. Um, business costs for a practice a month are around $50,000. Um, if you do the math by Medicare numbers, we get paid 120, 130 bucks an hour if you bill that way. Um, we um, probably buy our six docs about $6 million of, sorry, $8 million worth of chemo a year and sell it for about 10. And that money pays our salaries, uh, which are average-ish, and uh, all of the expenses of our practice. Um, without selling chemotherapy, we wouldn't be in business. It's as simple as that. Uh, and frankly, that's somewhat shameful. Um, we lack studies that show the best practices and value for patients. And I'm telling you, um, I just retook my boards. Um, and uh, I, I just, I can't be anything more than pretty good and a number of different disciplines. We have a lymphoma doc now from Stanford who, who brought us uh, an expertise that I never even knew existed. Lymphoma is about 16 do different diseases now, let alone breast cancer and lung cancer now. It's very complicated what we do. And we don't have adequate studies that not only show what's best, but put some values on what's best. Uh, we lack tools. I'll get into that in a minute. Uh, we have a terrible time getting paid. I'll talk about that too. EMRs, um, uh, can't it, I, <laughs> You understand. And the perverse incentives. I'll talk a little about that. Um, the insurance companies have incentives not to pay us. Forgive me, Lee. Um, there's no clear contract. We have a contract, but it's not clear. I never know if I'm going to be paid or not. And I'm stunned at when I have to go back and fight for the money for the drugs that I've already bought and given to the patient. Usually, I get paid for them. Prior authorizations mean nothing. Um, the computer systems at the insurance companies cannot 
handle the great ideas people like Lee Newcomer and others have. It just doesn't work to help us solve problems. Um, we, Medicare is a break even, and we can't cough shift anymore, or it's getting more difficult to do. Um, and some of these drugs, Provenge, cost 100,000 uh, bucks for shots. Um, pharma and devices, staggeringly increasing costs uh, with marginal benefit. I mean, Tarceva for pancreatic cancer is a terrific example. Um, same for technology. Um, drug shortages have driven us crazy. Uh, so, you know, what's the secret? Um, you can't make money selling drugs that have a margin of a few bucks, so nobody makes those drugs anymore. Uh, and patient assistance programs are terrible. Good care is expensive, but may not need to be as expensive as care is today. If we pay for what our patients need and want and what works, maybe we get better care at a more reasonable cost. Uh, we've been talking about this for years. Uh, here's Tom's talk. I was going to read from it. Um, this was in uh, Tom Smith, 2009. Uh, I made my talk, and then I read his and said, he said the same thing I'm about to say, but much better, and actually with data. Um, <laughs> I'm a trench doc. What can I say? Um, uh, we need a real fix. There are powerful stakeholders with divergent views and needs. Insurance, docs, hospitals, pharma. Maybe I've skipped some, but you get the idea. Um, and everyone needs to feel some pain, even us. Um, economies of scale will help uh, some of the practice costs. Unfortunately, many practices are being acquired by hospitals. This has actually raised the cost of cancer care. On the other hand, the feds want us to do ACOs, which means hospitals and docs have to work together, so go figure. Um, Medicare pays fast. Medicare is wonderful. We get paid in 17 days. The problem is they don't pay enough. But the beauty is I understand what they want. Not the same with other insurance companies. Um, you academics and me as an investigator need to do the studies that uh, show us what the best treatment is for different cancers and what the costs are so we can explain this to our patients. Uh, we've got lousy tools. I'll show you some. Um, I have no answer for the EMR thing. It's amazing to me that people say, why do you guys give so much chemo? Um, and then I remind them that that's what they pay us for, and then they kind of get it. If anyone has any question at all that doctors like everybody else, respond to incentives, uh, we can talk afterwards. Um, <laughs> ASCO has done a terrific job in this top five thing. Uh, Howard Brody was a med student of mine at Michigan State. He's a good guy. Uh, this top five thing was his idea. This is, as you see at the bottom, Tom Smith's form, which we stole years ago with his permission. On it, I answer the questions that the patient has circled What's my prognosis? What are appropriate goals? This sheet focuses me and the patient on the things that are important to her. This lady came in to see me after the diagnosis of metastatic breast cancer a week later with brain meds. We radiated her brain. Then I saw her monthly to talk about chemotherapy, which she never got. She lived nine months, which is how long she would have lived, perhaps, by the numbers if she had gotten chemotherapy. Um, no treatment is always an option. It may not be a good option if you've got uh, early stage breast cancer or, or Hodgkin's disease, but it's always an option. And we often talk about resuscitation at the very first visit. This isn't my idea. I just adopted Tom's tool. We need more tools, frankly, so when Armstrong publishes in the New England Journal the article about IP chemo, a gazillion practices around the country has to come up with the same set of standing orders over and over and over again. Wouldn't it be great if an electronic copy of an order set were in the back of the New England Journal, well, electronically, uh, that we could download? I've been railing uh, 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 with editors for years about this, but this only helps me in the trench. It's not an academic kind of thing. These kinds of things, the tools that allow us to practice good medicine, that help us through each day, 
or what are needed. Some fixes. Selfish on my part. I want a platinum card. Not cisplatin, please. A platinum card. <laughs> I want a card that because we're doing a good job, gets me paid. Um, again, selfish. We need incentives for practicing good medicine, however you define it. We need to insist on clear benefits for patients so that they know what they're getting and I know what they're getting and appropriate rules for payment and authorization. When something's authorized, it me really needs to mean that it's authorized. Uh, we need better drugs that are clinically superior with clear indications based on excellent trials. I mean, you understand. Uh, we need good tools to implement their use. And we need an EMR that actually works. Um, what can the docs do? We need to be patient-centered. Thanks for your comments. Uh, we need to be accountable. My old man was a CPA. He understood and explained to me that in a job, you've got a boss, you've got to be accountable. I understand who my boss is. You're my boss. I need to be accountable to my patients and to the insurance companies who pay me. We need to use guidelines. We need to document our thinking. We need to learn palliative care. Um, uh, I'm running out of time. Those of you who have the influence need to influence the policymakers and the politicians and the pharma companies and the insurance companies. I can't in my office. Uh, you need to explain this to them. And very importantly, we need to talk about the ethics of medicine. It's, a, it's an important ethical issue as to whether I, as a principal investigator and first author, have a piece of stock in a company. But it's equally as, port, as important, and maybe even more important, that my patient know and I discuss with them the ethics of my conflicts in the office. In, and I'll close with, um, and this may be a rude thing to say to patients, but they often expect to be treated and even want to be treated. And when I feel the treatment is futile, uh, one of the things I've said is, uh, look, I know I can make you sick, but I'm not sure I can make you better. And maybe we ought to talk about changing our, um, our goals from making you live as long as you possibly can to making you live as well as you possibly can. Patients really get that. And I think if we spend time in discussions like that, we can save a significant amount of money, but maybe not enough. Thanks very much. All right, we're going to round out this uh, discussion with Bob Green from the Cancer Centers for Excellence. And, and please stay because we'll have, uh, have time for discussion uh, at the end of this session. We'll take a brief break. And uh, I understand Peter's arrived somewhere. There he is. Uh, after the break, Peter. Thanks. Good morning, and thanks for having me here. It's actually really an honor. And uh, so thanks to the Institute of Medicine. Uh, I'm going to give you a community oncology perspective today, maybe a little bit different than things that you've heard um, before, but focusing on a lot of the uh, same themes. And first, to just give you a little background about myself, I have two jobs. My first job is, is, is as a medical oncologist in the community. I practice and help manage uh, a practice called the Palm Beach Cancer Institute. We're a multi-specialty oncology practice. We have 13 medical oncologists and other physicians who provide other cancer-related services. Uh, we have four offices, we go to seven hospitals, we see a lot of new patients every year, and I would argue that we do a really nice job of taking good care of patients in the community. And that's how I spend half my time. The other half of my time is spent as the chief medical officer of a network of clinical practices called Cancer Clinics of Excellence. We were founded in 2007. We have 23 practices, about 200 oncologists spread across 17 state, uh, states with 87 actually different office sites. We also see a lot of new patients as a network a year, and we've developed evidence-based treatment protocols that cover most of the major cancers, uh, as well as most episodes of supportive care. And we've developed novel clinical trial initiatives. We're integrating molecular diagnostics into our work stream, linking that data with clinical data. Uh, and lastly, a recent quality and uh, cost of care initiative, which, we, which we've undertaken with a new partner that I'll talk to you a little bit um, at the end. 
So 80 to 85 percent, that's the percentage of patients with cancer that are treated in the community. So clearly any solution that looks at providing cost and aff uh, affordability and quality to cancer patients has to include uh, measures that are going to be effective within the community oncology world. Um, so actually, I'm having second thoughts about putting a picture of myself this big on a, a screen. But um, um, I, I like this picture because it reminds me of how lucky I actually think I am. Uh, and I think we all are, those of us who are medical oncologists. Um, you know, we're fortunate to be able to help remarkable people go through remarkably difficult times in their lives. So this is a patient of mine, and uh, this is me after I ran a 5K about a year and a half ago uh, for a not-for-profit foundation that's part of our practice. And after I finished the race, I didn't know he was going to be there, but my patient tapped me on the shoulder. Um, he was actually in the middle of receiving palliative gemcitabine for metastatic pancreatic cancer at the time he ran this 5K. And uh, his first comment what, to me was, don't worry, I didn't beat you, um, which I was uh, relieved about. Uh, and then his second comment was, can I take my picture with you? And, uh, you know, I don't get people very often who ask to have their pictures taken with me. So we took this picture, and six months ago, which was a year later, uh, his family was at the race. He had died. And they were all wearing T-shirts commemorating uh, him. And uh, on the T-shirt, one of the pictures was uh, this picture. And so, you know, walking through an oncology clinic every day is really walking through a gallery of profiles in courage. And so I think it's really important that we remember that and focus on that. And it's why it's all the more troubling uh, that the current model is not sustainable, as this article by Dr. Smith and Dr. Hilner and many others have pointed out. It's actually the reason that we're all here uh, today. Um, so to lay out the current landscape a little bit, at least as I see it from the community oncology perspective, we've talked about revenue from drug margins and how kind of perverse this whole system is. We don't get paid for multiple support systems that go on in our practice. Um, we are, and I think, Jesse, you mentioned uh, increasing payment for cognitive time for physicians. I think that's a great idea, obviously. Um, we have no motivation to consider the cost to the system, and there were discussions yesterday about the important need to discuss patient costs with patients, and I think we've learned to be very good about that, but we don't really have any motivation in the current system to think about costs as they relate to the system. And as has been brought up, attempts to control these costs may be having the opposite effect. We actually have seen within our network, and I've seen locally within our community, practices that have left the community and gone into hospital-based systems. And that, I would argue, creates a scenario in which no one uh, really wins. This is an article from uh, the News and Observer in Charlotte, North Carolina, about practices and their patients who have gone into hospital systems and the costs end up going up. Um, and clearly, that's not good uh, for anyone. So um, I wanted to lay out, um, this is what happens when you go from a Mac to a PC, um, what, um, some of what I view, and this is a not scientific list of some of the barriers to affordable and quality care uh, in the community, and focus on information technology, the increasing complexity that we see as community oncologists in trying to take care of all cancer patients, and the misaligned incentives that we're dealing with. Um, so this article, which reads, Medicare bills rise as records turn electronic, um, would not have been a surprise to anyone who was around when electronic medical records were starting their implementation into practices. They clearly came in with the message that we will be good for helping you document and helping you code, and not necessarily for doing other things. So it was no surprise, or should have been no surprise to anyone, that after a period of use of electronic records, certain things like coding for physician visits, hospital visits, are going to get better, and by virtue of that are going to get up, or going to go up. But at the same time, I would argue that there has been a dismal failure of electronic health records to actually do the things that they're supposed to do. So I want to read you a few quotes from uh, articles in the New England Journal this summer. Um, Most EHR vendors not only have failed to innovate, but don't even allow innovative uses of data and interoperation with other software. Swapping out the medical record cabinet for a computer is proving insufficient to realize the benefits of health IT and doctors become increasingly bound to documentation and communication products that are functionally decades behind those they use in civilian life. And there is no sharper contrast for me to walk out of my clinic with the electronic medical record system that I have that feels like it's something out of the 1980s and to go home and deal with technology in my real life. 
So before I go to bed every night, I talk into my iPhone and I tell it what time to wake me up. And not only does it recognize my words, but through natural language processing, it knows the point I'm trying to get across and it skips about four clicks that I would otherwise have to do to set my alarm. And what's really interesting and, and a little bit disturbing too is that you know in my practice it's very hard for me to find out what's happening with my patients because of the limitations of technology but I am certain that someone out there knows what time I wake up every morning and could graph it and chart it and analyze, analyze it uh, 30 different ways so it's, uh, it's, it's an interesting contrast. Um, so I want to talk about uh, the fact that I really truly believe we are unprepared uh, for how to deal with the increase in complexity that's going on uh, with the treatments that we give. Uh, and before I tell you what the oncologist's um, prayer is, you know, cocktail party conversation, hey, are you, how's work? And I say, it's really busy. And people say, great. And then they pause and they say, well, wait, you're an oncologist, right? I guess it's not great. And then they say, so what are you going to do if there's a cure for cancer? Is there ever going to be a cure? And what are you going to do for work? And I say, well, if there's a cure for cancer, I'll find something else to do. But it's probably not that simple. So the oncologist's prayer is, dear Lord, let there be a cure for cancer. And let it be very, very complicated. <laughs> so and I wish I'd thought of that myself. But I did. I hear, hear. So, um, so this is an un, so you got to be careful what you wish for. So this is an unscientific graph that I got just going through the FDA website from 1992 to the present day, looking at new cancer drugs that have been approved for the treatment of cancer, and I extrapolated uh, the last quarter of 2012. But I think it's probably pretty fair to say that the slope of that line to, as we get towards the present day is probably relatively accurate. And while I share Dr. Schrag's uh, enthusiasm about all of the new treatments, again, as a community oncologist who takes care of different drugs, um, I get a little bit worried and a little bit scared. There's all these drugs with funny looking names, and actually the brand names are, um, what happened to my clicker here? And the brand names aren't really any simpler than the, um, uh, than the generic names. So we're faced with an onslaught of new drugs with new side effects that we really need to learn how to manage and learn how to use. And I'm not sure that we have the tools that will adequately enable us um, to do that. And I really do believe that the more complex things get, the more we're likely to commit errors. And um, I've wanted to do this experiment, and I haven't yet. But on the left is a list of brand names of new cancer drugs. And on the right is a list of the generic names. But they're not matched up. So I wonder what would happen if you took a room full of very smart medical oncologists and asked them to draw a line from the brand name to the generic name. And um, I think you could probably find a lot of really smart, really good docs um, who wouldn't necessarily be able to do that. And, and that's a problem. And I don't think it's a problem with the docs. I think it's a problem with our ability to adequately use technology to help us manage um, complexity. Um, so I like to fly little planes with one engine. Um, and uh, this is a picture of my daughter and I flying over the uh, Everglades. So I would never um, get in my little plane with one engine and fly over a swamp or a body of water without making sure I did everything I could to ensure that everything is going to work properly. And you know where I'm going um, with this. Um, so before I put my family in the airplane, I go through a checklist that very clearly makes sure that I've done everything I need to do before I get in the plane. But if you're a patient in this country or any country with diffuse large B cell lymphoma or any disease and you walk into an oncologist's practice, you're hopefully going to get a very conscientious physician who's going to know the literature. And if they don't, they're going to have references to look at. But they don't have a systematic way of going through and making sure that everything that needs to get done, that needs to be done, is done. And just one example on the slide, hepatitis B testing. So there's a black box warning for rituximab, which is often used in lymphoma, that you need hepatitis B testing before you use it because there's a risk of hepatitis B reactivation. I am certain, as much as I can be anecdotally, that that gets missed sometimes because without the systems in place to make sure that it doesn't get missed, it's going to. And there's a slew of examples that I could use of places that we need checklists in medical oncology um, that we don't have them. And so I believe that complexity leads to errors, and that's going to drive up expense. Um, we know that checklists prevent errors. We've seen it in the surgical uh, specialties. We need to figure out a way to translate that into medical oncology, and not with paper checklists. There needs to be a, an integrated electronic way to do it. Um, I believe that pathways can help clinicians manage complexity, but again, I think they need to be integrated into the proper information technology uh, 
platform. And I strongly believe that we need decision support tools to help us manage our patients. I think we need to be able to provide feedback to clinicians about what's going on in their own practices because we know so little about what's going on in our own practices. And we need to be able to estimate the utility of interventions. We talked um, yesterday about only using uh, white blood cell growth factor in patients who have a risk of febrile neutropenia of greater than 20 percent. Well, that's an example of something that's relatively easy to calculate, but you need to look at your patient comorbidities. And there are multiple other scenarios where you're faced with estimating the risk of an event and trying to make the right intervention. And it shouldn't be something that every time that happens, we either have to hope our memory's right or go pull up a reference to make sure that we're doing it right. There needs to be a way to integrate our patient information, integrate how we're treating our patients, and help us with these problems. Um, so misaligned incentives. Um, this has come up multiple times over the past uh, day and this morning that we don't share the same incentives as uh, our payers do. Um, what Dr. Newcomer and United, United is doing is very exciting and very interesting because it's an attempt to align uh, those um, incentives. Um, but we need to figure out a way to do that. And um, if you haven't read this book, it's a great book called Team of Rivals by Doris Kearns Goodwin. It's actually being made into a uh, movie by Steven Spielberg uh, next month. And Team of Rivals is about Abraham Lincoln and how he brought into his cabinet his political rivals and how that conflict um, actually resulted in it being a better presidency. And I think that we need to learn to work together to solve our problems and to get beyond what has you know, quite often been many times an antagonistic uh, relationship. And that's why I'm actually excited about a new initiative uh, that we've embarked on at Cancer Clinics of Excellence with a company called Accretive Health. And I'll read you the news release, Accretive Health and Cancer Clinics of Excellence to develop innovative program providing oncology care management. Um, to tell you a little bit about Accretive Health, they're a, a large publicly held company that was founded in 2003 to assist healthcare clients to strengthen financial stability and improve the quality of care. And they've developed a very successful shared savings, high quality model uh, in the primary care setting. And part of the way they've done it is by investing resources in practices to help the practices succeed. So um, we are uh, collaborating, and we're in the early stages of that collaboration to develop a physician-led, high-quality shared savings model of care in oncology. It's founded on the belief that we both share that we need to invest heavily in resources um, to enable this to happen, both from the standpoint of IT development to help us collect data, interpret data, and act on it, to focus on quality outcomes, Identify high-risk patients, that small percentage of patients with the bad outcomes and the high cost, but you need to have the data to identify who that's going to be. To focus on coordination of care, maybe we need to hire care coordinators in the practices. We need to make investments in the practices, and we hope that this partnership will enable oncology practices to do this. For appropriate end-of-life care, maybe we need psychological counselors or more of them in the practice. We need to have the right tools. It takes investment, and it takes resources. We need to prevent unnecessary care. So my office uh, answers the phone between 9 and 4.30 in the afternoon. There's a huge amount of time that the phones aren't answered, so maybe we we need to invest in the resources to figure out how we're going to answer phone calls after hours other than the on-call physician, how we're going to provide after hours or weekend care for patients. These things all require uh, investments. And as Dr. Newcomer made the point before about the employer saying we want to be able to prove first before we pay, the physicians need a mechanism for getting the resources because it's hard for an oncology practice to say we're going to devote these resources ourselves and hope that we're going to, at the end of the day, um, get paid. And I think adherence to pathways, there's a lot of talk about adherence to pathways. I think it's something that needs to be done, but I think you need the tools and the resources to be able to do that, to track it, and to show that you're actually, um, and to show that you're actually making a difference. So our goal is to align our incentives with payers, um, to share in those savings, um, and to achieve the triple aim, tailored care for the patient, better care for the uh, population, and lower costs. And at the same time, to always remember and to go back to the fact that we need to actually preserve our ability uh, to take care of cancer patients, because there are really uh, important reasons for us to do that. Thanks very much. All right, if we could have our panelists come up. We'll have 15, 20 minutes for questions. If you have a question, please to come to one of the microphones on either end of the room.
right. Oh, uh, please, uh, as you're uh, um, stating your, before you state your question, please just uh, tell everyone your name and uh, what organization you're from for our uh, records. I'm Tom Feely from MD Anderson. So, um, Lee, I'm very impressed with the preliminary episode-based payment data. And we've all seen this variability. And the variability, we think, because, uh, happens because people utilize different things. And they, we utilize different things at different rates because we get paid for them. So my question is, as we look to the future, how do we make a transition from what we're used to? And that is being paid for each x-ray and being paid for each laboratory test. And I will tell you, our institution, which is a large business, is very dependent upon the current status quo. How do we get to this glide path, if you will, from where we are now of being very dependent on this payment structure to where we need to be in terms of a new payment structure that actually moves the incentives back to us. So that's what the episode program is all about. Um, and I think we're midway through the experiment. We, we've set up the financial incentive so that basically if they reduce variation, they're almost certainly going to be paid more. Uh, there will be occasional times when reducing variation will actually increase utilization. There's no penalty for that, but if they reduce it, and that's clearly an opportunity, payments go up. The, what's to, where the jury is still out, because A, it's early, and B, it's hard, um, is now that we know where the variation is, how do we, in each of those practices, reduce it? So um, I, I pointed to John Sprandio as somebody who's done it, and I don't know whether John's a very nice benign dictator or whether he has technology that could be transferred to other groups. And in fact, I think he's experimenting with that now. It, it, the question is, though, once we have that information, do we have the leadership and the systems to begin standardizing the approaches? Now, uh, my other job is I'm, I was a former chair of Park Nicollet. It's about a 1,000 physician group. And there's no doubt from our experience there, as, as you've also seen at Geisinger and Virginia Mason and others, that um, you can standardize processes and cause substantial reductions in the cost of delivering care. In one week at Park Nicollet, just by standardizing how we did colonoscopies, we increased our volume 40 percent with the same staff. Um, so we made people, though, do it the same way. You know, rather than each doctor having their own individual approach, um, and that, that was the, uh, the key difference. Now, in that case, in the fee-for-service world, obviously, we benefited because we were doing more procedures. We got paid more. By flipping that with the episode payment, if you can reduce variation, we'll actually share that savings, and that increases the physician payment. But it's the only way I know how to do it. But, it, but in financial incentives alone are not enough. Uh, Tom Smith, Sid, Johns Hopkins Sydney Kimmel Cancer Center. We've heard several times that oncologists don't get paid for talking with patients. I'm an oncologist, but I'm also a hospice and palliative medicine person and an internist and play those roles at different times in my day. And in all those roles, we actually get paid for talking, for pa talking with patients. We have a structure by, for being paid for cognitive care. The problem is that it doesn't pay $407,000 annual salary a year. It might pay 200000 So it would be a substantial reduction in oncologist salaries. That said, are you proposing that on, for the oncologists on the panel, are you proposing that we be paid more for talking with patients than, say, an internist or a geriatrician? Or are you, would you propose a way that we maybe get paid for the difficult transition parts? like when you're moving from first line to second line chemotherapy or second line or third line or maybe even discussing advanced directives. Are you, what ways could you make possible for oncologists to recognize this and be paid for it in a way that's sustainable? Sure. Um, <coughs> oncologists aren't the only docs who have difficult discussions with their patients. Um, a nephrologist talking about long-term dialysis, uh, I don't imagine is an easy proposition. Um, and, and it occurs to me that there are lots of primary care docs who value uh, their relationship with long-term patients who want to have end-of-life 
discussions. Um, and being uh, thinking of myself as being equitable, Tom, I, I, you know, having those discussions is worth having those discussions. So all of us who do that kind of stuff should be paid um, uh, fairly. It's a lot easier to pro point out what the problems are than to come up with solutions, as, as you know. And I don't have uh, a simple answer to that question. I do know that, that, um, that what those of us who are here value is um, uh, an attentive listening ear of a doc to a patient and, and their family. Um, and that certainly isn't uh, how the payment system is, is arranged. It does not reward that behavior. And there's your non-answer. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, I think that you can, um, you know, the, the principle in my mind is that we ought not to be getting paid for drug margins, and we ought to get be getting paid for what we do. And the economics of, you know, community oncology and all of oncology is, is flipped right now. Um, so whether that means paying more for cognitive services or whether that means paying for the support services that you give in the practice that are otherwise not compensated for the you know long phone calls that you have with patients on the phone outside of clinic hours or family meetings. I mean, I don't know what the right answer is, but I think it's shifting the revenue from drug margins, which makes no sense, to what we do that does make sense. Sharon Murphy, a scholar here at IOM. And we heard a lot yesterday uh, in relation to innovative new models, accountable care organizations, medical homes, bundled payments. And again, this morning, Jesse made a plea for an oncology medical home and you're bundling payments. So I just have a kind of practical question, you know, call me slow to understand how this is actually going to work, particularly for uh, the increasingly older population that has multiple comorbidities, that has heart failure and cancer and or diabetes and cancer and, you know, these complex comorbidities um, complicate cancer care certainly, but uh, also taking care of the patient and, and uh, take more time and effort. So I guess I'm wondering from a practical point of view, like how many bundles does it take to make a patient? I don't know. You know? <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> <laughs> so I'm one of those old fossils that Deb referred to yesterday um, who um, got his first certificate in internal medicine and then got an oncology subfellowship. And, and my philosophy, I think, is still the same as it was then, is that um, the most complex disease doctor is the guy who, uh, or, or the woman who's responsible for the rest of that patient's care. And they may not do it all but they need to coordinate it. Um, and so most of the time when you're in the middle of an oncology or a cancer diagnosis, that is by far and away the predominant disease. And, and I think as oncologists, we have the responsibility to, to look at the whole patient, not just be the treatment technician. And um, we may not be able to handle the angina, but we can at least make sure that the cardiologist is aware and adjusting meds is necessary, and that we are aware of the interactions. Um, so I, I think it's usually the prevailing disease is the home. Um, as far as bundles, on a very technical standpoint, we haven't found a, a need to adjust. The way we set the episode payment up, uh, the office visits are all fee for service. And we did that very deliberately so that there would never be a barrier to getting people in. So even though we pay a bundle, we still pay all office visits fee for service in that program for both the oncologist and anybody else they're referring to because we felt outpatient access was absolutely critical. Um, if the patient goes in the hospital, that is part of the bundle and the physician doesn't get paid any extra for seeing them there. So long, the, the short answer, I think the prevailing disease is the, is the team captain and um, we all have that training to be able to do that. And secondly, uh, uh, I'd say that most of the time those other diseases are part of the natural course of the disease. So I don't know that you need a lot of adjustment for the bundles. My name is Puneet Singh. I'm with the Creative Health. And my question is for Lee. It's a, actually a follow-up on the last question. How do you see United Strategy going forward beyond the current experiment? And given your recent comments, how do you think about a fully capitated or shared savings model? 
And how do you look at engaging with providers? What sort of framework do you use to assess their readiness for a model like that? So I, I'm not at all in favor of full capitation. That's why I got up and made the comment yesterday. Um, I think that's too much risk for uh, because of the small numbers involved and the very high costs. Um, so I would be very reluctant to enter into a full capitation agreement unless it was somebody um, as large as CCE, U.S. Oncology, who could handle a very large risk with a very large patient population. And that's not the United States today. So the reason we pay drugs at cost is we don't want anybody uh, going underwater because they suddenly got three expensive patients. Um, we do want them partially sharing risk so that they're in the, in the game thinking about how they can make that care better. And I think you have to balance those. Giving full capitation to an ACO is a whole different matter. You have, you have the entire uh, spectrum of uh, both illnesses and payments, including lots of well patients, and you have big enough numbers to make it work. Um, but I, I can't see that happening in a narrow specialty. Thank you. Uh, hi, I'm Harvey Cohen from Duke University. So this wasn't what I came up here to say, but I feel I must uh, respond to Sharon's question and your comment. Uh, as a part geriatrician, part oncologist, I, I would dispute the likelihood that the oncologist is going to be able to assume the leadership, let alone the care, for all the multiple complex comorbidities that older cancer plus other diseases have. And I think some sort of shared care model is going to be essential if we're going to do that. Peter made the comment that they just brought the lymphoma expert in and he knew all this stuff that he that Peter hadn't even thought about yet. Well, I, I suspect that if you were going to worry about the di uh, managing a semi-out of control diabetes in the context of uh, cancer care, he'd likely know even less about that. No knock on Peter or Bob, but I think that's the reality. It's the reality we see. So I, I think a shared care model of some sort is going to be important to do this. So the question I actually came up to ask was of, of Peter and Bob, and that is, uh, you both commented on the electronic medical record, which is a favorite whipping horse for many of us, but uh, I, I wonder if you would comment on what you see other than having it replace the filing cabinet of, 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 of paper records to be the three or four most important things you'd like to see the electronic medical record do to help us in the care of patients as well as perhaps even think about lowering costs. Sure. So, I, you know, the first thing I think is it needs to help you take better quality care of your patients, and that's by integrating medical knowledge um, and making it really a decision support tool. So I think doing things like calculating the IPI for a new lymphoma patient for you and making sure that that's done, making sure that if you're giving new lasta to someone with a risk of febrile neutropenia that's really low, that it asks you why, or make sure that you're giving it to someone who has a high risk when you haven't ordered it. So I think decision support and safety measures are the most important. Um, the second most important thing I think is, you know, they don't, the EMRs today don't force you to put in relevant data points. And it's why I think we have so much difficulty actually knowing what's going on in our practices and what's going on with care. And, you know, what Amy Abernathy was saying yesterday about the need to be able to pull data and really do comparative effectiveness research within a practice um, and across practices is important. And you just can't do it now because we can't get at the data. I mean, I feel like every time I see a patient and move on to the next room, I feel that I've thrown away information from that encounter that could be useful to someone somewhere else, um, and there's just not really a good mechanism for either collecting it or for analyzing it after it's been collected. So Rob and I had a chance to talk, uh, and we realized we had the same electronic medical record. He asked me what I thought of it, and I said, it stinks, it's terrible, and some things that I can't say on TV. Um, and he said, no, I think you're wrong. And I thought in my mind in that instant, I haven't even told you this, uh, I'm not going to like this guy because he likes it. And his response was, it's even worse than that. <laughs> um, what it will calculate the appropriate carboplatin dose if you have the BSA and, and the creatinine. But it won't stop me from giving uh, cytotoxic, I mean, uh, marotoxic chemotherapy if the platelet count is 10,000. Um, it, um, it, it, it as, you, as Rob mentioned, was designed for billing, and that's what it does. 
It's not designed for me to care for patients. So not only does it keep me, not only doesn't it keep me from hurting people and remind me uh, what to do, like the checklist, um, but it certainly doesn't give me the kind of data that I want out. We have a non-operative esophageal cancer protocol, and I want to see how we're doing. It's, it's, it's Excel. <laughs> you know, it's not in my record. I can't do it. Um, so there's so much wrong. Um, it's not quicken. It needs to be quicken. It needs to work as a Windows program. It feels more like a DOS program. And the only other thing I would add is that, you know, what it's forced people to do is have all sorts of workarounds in the practice. I mean, one of the kind of best examples of dealing with that is in John Sprandio's practice, they've developed, is it Iris, John? Is that the, you know, which is kind of an add-on that sits on top of their EMR, which is also the same EMR that we have. Um, but, um, you know, and that gives it functionality that it doesn't have. But it's crazy that we're in this situation that we need to do things like that. But I think that we, that we do. So I've got to respond to both your comments. Um, I, I think we're actually in violent agreement about uh, the shared services. Um, I just think that it's, it's not necessary to make a patient have 16 appointments every week. The internist can figure out the diabetes, or the oncologist can figure out the diabetes under control and then get the help. But that patient shouldn't have to go see the, the endocrinologist every week as well as the medical oncologist. So uh, we're talking the same flavor, probably just different words. Uh, second, I actually am still an EMR proponent. Um, Park Nicollet right now is profitable only because of the EMR and the quality payments we're receiving. Um, with the EMR, we've, we, we can identify every diabetic in the system and we hit all of our quality measures. And it is literally the difference between us being underwater and making a profit is the, uh, the quality payments we got from the various payers in uh, the Minneapolis region. Um, so with the right resources, you can use that EMR in a, in a very positive way. Um, but the criticisms are certainly well-founded. I agree with that. But you probably have an IT department with really smart and a lot of them. And I got an IT of one or two people. Right. Uh, and they're smart, but not smart enough. We have one or two people, too, but they are really smart. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, the man who has been referred to many times, I'm going to give you the last question of this session. Okay. Uh, it, it, it's more a, a comment that might evolve into a question. But I, I mentioned yesterday that we're really in a, a transition period. Uh, you know, the, the, the model that we've been working on uh, has been based on the IOM critiques of uh, oncology care, the ASCO guidelines, the NCCN guidelines, the COA outcomes uh, targets, and so on. Um, you know, we, we went through a process of, of practice transformation. Uh, we developed um, a software overlay so that, that our EMR was functional. Um, I spend 90% of my time in our overlay. The rest of the staff spends 100% of their time, uh, the non-physicians. Uh, we really do think that we have data that shows we are providing better care, better health at lower cost. This is a transition model. Um, and and we, we really have to, to understand that repairs have to understand that we need support during this transition, whether it's the bundled payments or any other payment methodology that comes down the pike, we need to make these changes. The changes we made in our practice were relatively easy compared to the hurdle of, of uh, developing a payment model around this platform. Um, so the, uh, uh, I did write it, uh, uh, actually uh, Dr. Grumman asked me what happened in the past two years since our first article in December of 10. I, I did publish a, a perspective piece. It was in the American Journal of Managed Care, outlining some of the issues that are facing community oncology and oncology in general. Um, and uh, but we need uh, an understanding. We need, we need standardization, which hopefully the NCQA will will provide. Uh, they're in the process of, of developing specialty recognition standards for uh, oncology, and then we need payers to respond to that standardization. So it, it really is a, a, an exciting, um, sometimes terrifying transition time for community oncology, um, as well as academic-based programs. Um, so more comment than question, but comment to uh, uh, respond to that, Lee, if you can. John, I just wanted to underscore one thing you said, though, and that's the fact that you produced the data to show your results. And um, you, know, you, you know the old cliche, and God, we trust everyone else, bring data. And, and that is what I'm running up against, against the country. I'm getting lots of calls of people saying, we're making these infrastructure changes. Let's talk about a new fee schedule um, now. And what 
what the employers are saying back to us very clearly is we want to see it executed with results, which is what John has done. And, and so there is a transition period there where changes are made, but make sure you're measuring from day one so that you can come in and say, things have changed. We are clearly making a difference. And, and that's what he's done. Uh, I can't praise that enough. So after I read the um, account of the oncology medical home, uh, I was struck by the, the very expectation that I had that any of my oncologists could have delivered all of the things that I needed in order to make my way through my treatment. You know, the, the after hours care, the quick phone call, the um, advice about you know, diet and wound care and just just the sheer number of, kind of it, it, this is kind of often delegated to kind of psychosocial stuff. But for us, this is the stuff that keeps us on track. This is the stuff that keeps us going back for chemotherapy because we can manage this time, you know. I mean, this kind of support when we're doing so much at home on our own is so incredibly important. And I, I really have great hopes for that kind of um, support for oncologists to give us what we need in order to stick with the program. Well, that was a great way, I think, to wrap up this session. We're going to take a 10-minute break, come back at 9.50. Uh, and uh, thank you again to all the panelists for attending.